So welcome. Um, we are going to record this just as a heads up, but um, just wanted to welcome you. Um, over the last two months, we've had a flurry of e-commerce trainings. Um, so today we're actually sharing about Reco, which is one of my favorites for its accessibility, its ease of use, and that, if, that it's free. <laughs> so that's good. So I'm, I'm with the Community Alliance with Family Farmers, Michelle, and I'm also here with the uh, Center for Land-Based Learning out of California. And um, one of their Farm Academy student graduates, Linda Easton Waller. So, and I want to send a huge, huge thanks to Linda because it was really because of her that this is even happening. She did a lot of the research and put this together and brought it to our attention. So, kudos to her. Um, so, over the next hour, we're going to, Linda's going to share an overview of what the RECO Ring is. And then we have a few farmers from across the country who are going to share their different experiences and the stages that they're in and the, the different ways that they're applying the RECO ring to, to their operation. So, and then we also have some time for Q&A um, and then also uh, an additional time at the end where we can take you off mute and you'll be able to kind of um, talk more with the farmers and ask more questions. Um, so I do want to encourage you throughout the um, webinar at the bottom of the screen to add your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll be monitoring that and that's where we'll be pulling questions for the, the Q&A session. Um, also, feel free to use the chat session or the chat box for just comments and resources. Uh, if you have some technical difficulties, whatnot, we'll be monitoring that as well. Um, and then, like I said, we, were, we are recording this and we'll send out an email to everybody and share that in the resources at the end. So, am I getting everything? The bathrooms are down the hall. <laughs> I think all of us are getting a little wonky from all these Zoom meetings. So, I think I will turn it over to Linda to share an overview of the model then. Great. Welcome, everybody. We're really glad that you're here. We're so happy to have our presenters here today. Um, so RECO is a, a contraction of a term in Finnish that means responsible um, consumption, roughly. Um, so RECO started in 2013, and today in the Scandinavian countries, there are over 500 rings. Um, it's been a very successful model and um, it's caught the attention of, of other farmers around the world. And we are happy to have three um, farmers who have started record rings here in the United States. We believe that you guys are the, the very first ones. Um, so what I'm what I'm going to talk about is what is RECO, how do, who's involved, and how does it work. So you've got two groups of people. First, you've got um, your customers and then your suppliers. Who are your suppliers? Suppliers are farmers, value-added uh, producers, um, artisans. It can be, you know, anybody who's typically at a farmer's market. So we call those the suppliers. And where do they meet? They meet on a closed Facebook group, a private Facebook group. So once a week, if you're a farmer participating, um, if you're a supplier participating, then you're going to post once a week. And you tell a little bit about your, your, your farm, who you are, um, what you've got available that week, how much it is, and the units, and then your preferred method of payment. So that goes up. And then during the week, um, people browse, the customers browse. And so say they want to order something from you, they'll, they'll type in a comment and say, I'd like three dozen eggs, please. So you then go and you can reply back right there in the com to the comment, or you can take it off to Facebook Messenger and say, hey, thanks for your order. Your total is X dollars. I use PayPal. My PayPal um, email address is this, and please go ahead and make the payment. Once you receive the payment, then you can go back to that thread and say, hey, I got your payment. We'll see you at the drop-off Thursday at 6, if that's your drop-off. Or, or pick up. So that's where this model really varies from farmers markets is that um, pickup is just that. It's pickup. The only thing you are going to take are orders that have been um, paid for. So um, you and it's going to happen in a one hour time time window. So like say if it's Thursday at six from six to seven, then you drive your van or your truck there 
go to the parking spot. It's usually held in a parking lot somewhere. Um, and you open up the back, set up the table, and you have your clipboard with your, um, your orders. And your customers will come by, chat for a few minutes, pick up their order, and then in an hour, you're done. So it's not like an almost whole day commitment like a farmer's market is. So um, a typical week for you as a supplier is that like, so say pickup is on Thursday. So Friday morning, you would post your ad and then um, during the week, communicate with customers. And then usually there's a cutoff, an order cutoff um, for the rings. Um, so say, you know, Wednesday at noon, or it could be Tuesday night at midnight um, would be the cutoff. And then you, at that point, you'd go and um, pick and pack your orders and get them ready for the pickup point. So um, Buddha Brower, who is a uh, um, admin for the Reco ring in uh, Malmo, Sweden, he, he processes, I think he said like somewhere between 80 and 100 orders a week. And, um, he said that takes him about two hours, and that includes the time it takes for him to post his ad. So that gives you an idea of the time involved in, um, you know, in, in taking orders throughout the week. Of course, that's going to vary from person to person. Um, so that, that's RECO in a nutshell. Um, I've created a, a Facebook group called Reco Ring Resources. If you would like to go there, there's um, already some people there from California and from Australia, and um, they um, you can um, go and um, um, get resources. I've got a presentation there and a handout, um, a one pager. Um, so please join us there. So now um, I'd like to introduce um, Tracy. Um, she's our first Reco Ring admin to speak with us today. Tracy Mitchell's from the Denver Reco Ring, um, and their group is brand new. So she's going to talk to us about what she's learned about setting up a group and working with suppliers. So welcome, Tracy. Hey, what's up? I'm honored to be a part of this group and be sharing what I've learned and I kind of went for it. Um, if everyone like was just like how I wanted to start, I just literally listened to a podcast, uh, Farm Small, Farm Smart, and with Diego Footer, and it was like episode 206 from March 30th, and everyone should go listen to that, because it's just as informative as what Linda was saying, but it really gives you a head-on, like, deep deep dive in into everything about Reiko rings, and we this would be our week two, Friday's going to be our second week of trying, but no one's placing an order inside our group, is like our biggest thing right now. We have five producers and like 90 members, but like the members just aren't like, I see them liking posts, but no one's commenting to place an order yet. So I just think it's going to take like getting thousands of members in my personal opinion, like so far, just after not having any orders placed last week. I had one of my current customers say, can I pick, pick up at the Reiko ring? And I was like, no one's really coming. I'm fine with delivering. She lives like 10 minutes from our farm. So like we're slowly building. It's grassroots. That's kind of what I've always intended. And from there, I guess I've gone into like, we've landed a, like we're a microgreens farm. Um, we also bake bread and offer sourdough starters. And then I've tapped into like my chicken keeper, like who sells whole organic pasture aged chicken, uh, like a cow farm. Like I just kind of went from my local network of like who I tried to tap into in the last like few years of like trying to source locally and reach out to them and then have just trying to expand from there. Like I know a knife forger. And so he's like offered to like, put what he has available every week with like his knives that are like custom handmade blades. So I think everyone just like needs to tap into like anyone they know and then ask 10 more people. So your group can just keep growing organically. And then you're going to be attracting all the people that are already interested in, I guess, local fair consumption. And that's the end goal for me as a producer is to offer everyone who wants to be an entrepreneur, a farmer, a producer to give them that chance. So like, be transparent with your, I guess, I want all my producers to be transparent with what they're doing with their practices and how they handle everything. But at the end of the day, I think the producer also has to be follow through as a business owner and be due, due, due diligent with whatever they do and choose to, when they follow their practices, you know? And so as a customer too, like you have to ask your uh, producer what they do. But as I guess as the admin for my Reiko ring, I'm going to make sure I don't let anyone in who's not going to be following those permaculture and sustainable practices that I believe in as a farmer. Um, is there any, like, uh, I guess from there, um, I'm just going to keep asking people to, like, keep connecting and reaching out to people. And then if there's any other, like, questions that people have for me right now, I'm happy to expand on that. Um, 
I think I, I kind of covered like, I, it's just it's hard to it's hard to talk about like what where we're going because I'm only in week two and no one's placing orders so like if we have the same conversation like in six months I feel like I could share a lot more but my whole goal is to guess go organically and follow I guess I instead of using just a random park pickup I reached out to local breweries here in Colorado and the first one I reached out to they said yes in terms of letting us use their parking lot so if you live in a state that has tons of microbreweries, it's a great way to start connecting with like that local brewer as well as the producer. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of like where we're at as the Rake Green Denver. Tracy, can you talk a little bit about uh, maybe how you um, drew your customers or how you could build on that? Um, yeah, so I basically started with just like all of our microgreens customers and just told them to join the group and I've been asking everyone like inside our group to say, hey, please ask 10 more consumers to join. And I feel like every time I make that post, I feel like I get a few more posts every day. So I think it's really just a matter of making sure people, when they join, they know it's a, they, they should be sharing this information. Because that's how we're going to grow. It's, it's a matter of people telling others and people like explaining the little bit what RACO means real fast, you know. It's an online farmer's market. It's a great way to cut out the middleman. You're, you're supporting local and people who care about their product. That's like, I, I think the biggest thing is people walk into a grocery store nowadays and they don't know who they're supporting. And I think if we start inviting people to these groups, they'll actually see with their eyes exactly who they're supporting. They'll see the people behind the business and not just a, a brand name with a bunch of labels on it. Because labels, labels don't mean anything to me anymore, especially when you do, like someone could just pay for an organic label and it doesn't necessarily mean they're following an organic practice at all. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm like going blank here, but I, I feel like I have really not much else to share because it's just a, it's such a beginning part for us. And I'm, I'm just trying to be positive. Like when people aren't placing orders right now, it's not a, oh no, we're not going anywhere. It's going to be a slow build, just like gr growing a plant. It has to, it takes like water and love and people talking about it. Tracy, what are the most common questions that, that customers have about RECO? Um, I really, honestly, no one has really had like many questions. It's just like, how do I, like, they've just been like, okay, cool. I'll join. I guess the, the biggest thing right now is there's been lack of like anyone asking a question or placing an order. And I'm not sure what, where the missing element is there. I'm not sure what I need to do as an admin to like make people step up to trust that we're going to be there for their pickup, you know, or for the pickup and deliver the best food. I did have a customer though, uh, he's being out of town next week, but he's also interested in purchasing the chicken. And he's my migraines consumer. So like, it's just gonna take that one person and then two people and then, you know, the one person trusting, oh, I bought this awesome chicken and I also picked up my microgreens. So I, I feel like it's just gonna take that, that slow build and then just trusting that it's gonna, t it's gonna happen. Yeah, and, and we're, we have every confidence that it's going to happen for you guys. And I really appreciate you sharing your perspective as somebody who's just set up a ring. Um, I think we're all figuring out how to do this as we, as we go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All right. Thanks, Tracy. And then um, remember that you can post your questions in the Q&A um, box um, for Tracy, and we'll have some time afterwards to, um, for her to address those questions. Um, we're going to go on to... Um, to our next group, um, or our next presenter. Um, so uh, Vanessa Quinones from the Osaki area Reco Ring in Wisconsin. Um, they have, are currently in their sixth week um, and have 1,200 members. Uh, Vanessa is going to talk to us about um, working with um, Reco customers and adapting their pickup procedures um, for COVID-19. So welcome, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the group. I'm very honored to be here. I'm excited to share the things that we've learned as we've gone because it really has been a learn as you go process. But our group has been very successful. Tomorrow is our sixth week and we have almost 1200 members and every week it's just more and more people asking to invite the group to come to the group. So for us, it's just been the momentum has has been really exciting to watch. So um, we meet every week, Thursdays from six to seven, and because of everything that's going on with COVID, we just explain on the group page, there's no need for you to get out of your car. We A lot of people write their first and last names on a piece of paper and put it on the dash, and they pull up, pop the trunk, or open the back door, and we put everything in. We do wear masks. 
um, when we're there. It's my farm, as well as three other producers. Um, they were personal friends of mine, as well as local farmers in the area. And so I collaborate. I specifically chose them because one, I trusted their practices were all organic. One of us is not certified, but the rest of us are. Um, and the one farm that I chose, they are the oldest CSA farm in the state of Wisconsin and have over 4,000 members. So I thought their numbers just alone, because they already have such a presence in the community because they've been here. And then one of the other farmers um, I collaborated with, she's also a scientist. So she's very into detail. She's very detail orientated. So I thought that she would be good as setting up the page and being the admin. And then I'm just really good at connecting people and have a strong Facebook presence to begin with. So um, it was just real easy to get people to join the group. We really didn't have any issues whatsoever. But it's very quick in and out. It's one of the things that I love about it is it's you're in and out of there in an hour. And right now I'm only selling eggs. And last week I sold 64 dozen eggs just in that one pickup. So it's been really great. Did you have any other questions? Where, where's your pickup point, Vanessa? We originally chose a park because um, we didn't know how it was going to go, but we've outgrown the parking lot in that park. So we've actually had to move the location just about a half mile away in an old store that closed down, a store called Shopco. I don't know if you're familiar, but they have a huge parking lot. The space is completely unused and it just worked out perfectly where, because there's usually a line of cars. Um, it just works out really smoothly where people pull in. We all line up in the parking spaces with our trunks open. And then we all have chalkboard farm signs. Um, and people will pull up and we ask their names. And then we will generally yell down the line like we ask for their first and last name. And then I'll say to the next farmer the person's name and it just goes down the line so that they can prep. But by now we're getting so many regular customers um you just you just become familiar with people's cars but like i said we have had um really good luck with people putting signs in the dashboard that works really well because they pull up you can see their first and last name and it's just bam they don't even have to roll down their windows if they don't want to one of the things that i noticed that you've done differently on your site is that um Typically, the only time that people post, um, that customers post, is to place an order. But I noticed that on your page, people are posting after they pick up their order and they're, po they're posting pictures of, of what they received or what they made with the products that they got. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? So the two people that I invited that I came to after listening to Farm Small Farm Smart podcast, that's also how I heard about it. Um, I heard that podcast and I approached two of my friends and so we're the three admins. We have um, two other producers as well, but we're the three in charge of the page. And um, so we just, between the three of us, if there's something that we like, we just, you know, is it okay? We talk amongst the three, three of us. Are you okay if I post this? Um, but generally we, we have really good conversations and we just um, go back and forth between each other and just, post what we think is appropriate. And we try to be very clear in communications with our customers on, it's not a feed to talk about. If you want to ask questions, then private message us. Please only post what your orders are. I see, I thought your customers were posting those things, but it's you as admins who are kind of promoting the group within it. So they post, but then on, on the back end of, you can see as an admin, we have control of whether or not we allow it on the page. So we, we don't necessarily allow everything, but really pretty pictures that make our produce and our products look amazing, we'll, we'll post. Got it. Vanessa, would, would you be able to share your screen and show us the back end of what the system looks like? Sure, I would love to. <clears throat> this down. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so this is our page. 
<laughs> can everybody see it? And um, so this is my post for the week. We put our posts up on Friday mornings. Um, so we just, I always try to be very clear in instructions and just try to explain things to people. So <clears throat> everything is very clear. Right now, as I said, I'm only selling eggs. So um, I've got the pictures of the eggs and then you can see what, what will happen is people will comment and tell me what they want. And then what, what I do is to let them visually know that I've received their order, I will like it. And then I will private message them and um, confirm the order and ask them how they would like to pay. I say thank you for, for your placing your order. Welcome to our group. Um, I'm confirming your order for two dozen eggs. How would you like to pay? And then we arrange payment that way. And I take all the payments. So is that clear? Yeah, that's great. And you can see that um, the other firms that we work with, they will also, we, we like I said, we, we re really try to be clear on <clears throat> our intentions and the communication. Um, this is another farm, Willoway, that we work with. She does a lot of flowers. Um, this is another farm. They have microgreens. We were real intentional about the people we wanted to join our groups. We all do different things. Um, like Farm Happy, they do a lot of microgreens. They also offer honey and maple syrup. I'm pro I do pastured poultry. So I do meat and eggs and turkeys. And I also raise veggies, but I don't have any of those right now. And then <clears throat> Bossy Cow, she's like the one who, the main, she's the one who like put the page together. She's the scientist. She's really, really smart and really detail orientated. So <clears throat> she is a, she sells meat. So she has a dairy farm and she offers pork and beef. And um, so all of us really complement each other and it just works really, really well. So, and then Wellspring is um, a, a large CSA farm that we have, that has a large community. So it just works really well. Finding people that have the same um, practices as you, people that you believe in and um, where you all offer different things. It really is helpful because it offers the, the customers more variety. And I think that within itself draws people in. And the good thing as well is um, for the farms that are smaller and don't necessarily have a large social media presence, just being part of the group, like some of the other farmers who weren't really big on Facebook before, they're like, wow, now I have a thousand followers on, on my farm Facebook page. So it's really great if, if you weren't necessarily good at social media before, it really brings up your presence quite a bit. Right. What advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out with, with setting up a reco ring? To just do it. Like, don't be afraid. It's really easy. Facebook is a great platform to use because everybody has it. There are some nuances and you learn as you go just by playing around in Facebook. Um, but yeah, it's not difficult. Just be clear in your intentions and Make sure that you and the other producers that you're working with are all on the same page. And there's little things, some of the challenges that we've come across. People's Facebook names are different than their payment app names. So when you're going through and matching payments up with the Facebook requester, sometimes it doesn't match. It, it's it's a little bit more backward because you've got to follow through. But generally speaking, we're going into week six tomorrow and the issues have been really minimal. We really haven't had that many issues. A few missed pickups because people forgot, a few confused partners not knowing what farm to go to. But um, you, you learn from that incident and then 
communicate with your customers and how you can make pickups smooth for everybody. And it's been pretty seamless and flawless, actually. Great. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for sharing. And we look forward to watching your group continue to grow. That's, Thank that's you so much. Great. All right. So then next, next up, we have um, Cole from Brisa de Año Ranch in Pescadero, California. And Cole has adapted the RECO model for a single farm. So Cole's going to share his experiences about setting up um, a RECO ring of one. So take it away, Cole. Cole, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm still getting used to Zoom here. Um, my, my name is Cole Mastegos Anastasio. Um, I, along with my wife, uh, Veronica Mastegos Anastasio, and uh, our good friend, Cristobal Cruz Hernandez, the three of us are the owners, operators uh, of Barista Daniel Ranch. We're a small farm, uh, about eight acres in Pescadero, California. Um, we are about uh, a little more than an hour from San Francisco. Um, and so not, not too far from the Bay and kind of a, a rural stretch of, uh, of the coast south of there. Um, we uh, are a, a farm that, that tries to be pretty intentional about diversifying our market channels. And um, actually, I'm not sure if some, some viewers saw this, but we, we actually did another uh, webinar about a month and a half ago, I want to say, on, on kind of response to COVID at the time. And um, around that same time was kind of when we first started hearing a bit about record rings. Uh, we do most of our business being wholesale or direct sales to local businesses, largely being um, restaurants, small gro independent groceries, bakeries, online groceries, things like that. Um, we also uh, do a few farmers markets in a CSA. And CSA was actually the smallest aspect of our business, but in response to the COVID-19 crisis, we've sort of decided to shift a lot of that because a good chunk of our, our, our wholesale accounts were, or also sales were to restaurants. Um, which have been kind of slowly opening in our area, but we don't really anticipate getting anywhere near the same level of business as we had before. Um, so we've increased our, our, our size of our CSA to be quite a bit, where this year we expect it to be about a third of our, of our total revenue, um, which was about double what we had previously, previously done. And um, when we uh, were kind of planning that out, we came across record rings also from the same, uh, same podcast by Diego Footer, um, Farm Small, Farm Smart. Uh, we, um, we did a bit more research on it, and, and um, it was a new process for us, but it's, it's something that's excited us quite a bit. We um, intended to, uh, to to try and take that model and, and see if we could do it in our area with some other local farms. Um, because we had so many other kind of different moving variables regarding the COVID-19 crisis um, in terms of, of increasing the size of our CSA, and um, just another number of other things, uh, we felt that that we didn't want to initially start a full-on record ring um kind of on the same scale um we definitely uh would, would love to, to to be able to do that um it's, it's an ambitious task i think for us the tough things we just had so many moving parts going on that we figured how can we kind of take some of the advantages that you get from a record ring and kind of adapt it into our, our existing csa model um in a way that would work uh specifically for our farm and a handful of other businesses we, we work with so um, what we're doing is, is not so much uh, a true record ring, it's more of, of kind of doing an add-on model uh, for CSAs with other businesses, um, but in, in doing intentionally in a way that kind of gives us a lot of the benefits of, of the record ring model. Um, so what we've, we've done to sort of adapt that is uh, work with a, a number of, of other businesses. Um, we have allowed our CSA members, and we've got about 80 members CSA, to purchase um, uh, directly from from either their uh, independent stores or, or and kind of uh, I'll get to that in a bit or our store as well uh, to purchase their products um, and then have that added on to our CSA boxes or in a separate package depending on just how big of an item that is. Um, the advantage of this for us has, has been a couple of things. Um, one is that it's as Vanessa um, just spoke to a moment ago there's a big advantage of being able to kind of market mutually and, and having other businesses kind of do some of the advertising and marketing for you so the networks that they have via their social media, via their friends, um, have, have now been kind of uh, given to us as well, and, and vice versa, in the sense that they're able to post something on Instagram or Facebook saying, you know, join the CSA, um, you can also purchase our products here. And it's helped allow us to increase our CSA uh, to the level that, that it is now. And um, it's about, uh, about double of, of what we were planning on doing this year. So in the last couple of months, we've been able to increase it quite a bit. 
I think beyond that too, the other advantage has been that um, we have a bit of a concern that the CSA this year might be a bit of, of a unicorn just considering the COVID-19 crisis because you're seeing a lot more interest nationally in CSAs. And our fear is that we, this year we, we build up our CSA model and allow it to um, be a much more significant part of our business. But next year, um, God willing, COVID-19 is no longer an issue. But the, the chief tricky thing about that is a lot of people may just go back to purchasing at a grocery store and may not be as interested in CSAs um, as they are this year. And so we think that, that this model of kind of uh, a sort of a cooperative model a modified recurring model for our CSA will allow us to offer enough different products beyond just what we're doing as produce, but also other products as well that um, members would want to where it becomes such a, a, a significant part of their kind of eating habits because it's not just the produce, it's also the other things as well that they will therefore be more prone to kind of stay around for years and years to come. Um, so it's, in long story short, it's sort of a, a response to the COVID-19 crisis but we're doing it in a way that we hope will also allow this to be kind of a permanent um, building facet of our farm. Down the road, we are interested in doing kind of more of, of a true record ring uh, style. We, we, this year, we just didn't feel like we had the bandwidth quite to do that considering all the changes going on. But we think this is kind of a, a nice transitional step as well. And um, in terms of, of the details of kind of how we, we uh, work with other businesses that are part of this model, um, there, there's a bit of a, of a mixed bag. Um, some of the businesses are, um, are uh, having it to where we, we direct our customers, our CSA members, to purchase um, through their independent stores, which may be on like, their own Square websites, for example. Uh, we also have a Square online store as well, um, where we allow our CSA members to purchase add-ons, um, as well for their CSAs, like an extra flat of, of tomatoes, for example, or whatnot. Um, a couple other businesses want us to sell on behalf of them via our online store, so we're doing that as well. Um, so we're just adding their products directly on our online store. And um, in doing this, it's, it's allowed kind of a, a, a nice level of flexibility to where if we are finding for whatever reason, um, one particular business we're working with, like they don't have, have the cap capacity to provide product or, or be involved with this, um, we, we can sort of, uh, they don't necessarily have to be continuing part of, of the record ring if they feel it's not working for them. So it's a pretty low in level investment on their part. Um, and in our part as well. We simply um, include what stores are available uh, each week when we send out our CSA newsletter, which we send out first thing on Monday mornings. Um, we allow people to place orders on Mondays and Tuesdays up till 10 p.m. and then do our, our CSA deliveries on Thursdays. And so we direct on that on the newsletter, these businesses are going to be um, businesses you can purchase products from this week. And so it you know, will be you know, Flower Farm X, Kombucha Maker, why and so on basically. And um, any week that can change if, if that business feels they don't have the capacity to do it. Um, and that's been, I think, a, a benefit for a lot of the in involved um, business we work with just because they are in such a flux right now, a lot of them are going to be COVID-19 situation. So for example, we're working with one business that makes um, really good empanadas. Uh, they are traditionally before the COVID-19 situation caterers and their catering company kind of has, has not had business, which is why the transition making bananas. By doing it, this model works a bit flexible for them. They're able to commit to working with us now, but in the future, if they do get more catering business and they can no longer keep up with the banana business, it makes it easier. So I think it's been a, a, a system that's worked well for us so far. Um, it's something we want to continue growing and, and kind of expanding and, and, do it in response to the COVID-19 situation this year, but hopefully it be, hopefully it, it kind of is a built-in part of our, of our CSA and our model for years to come. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Do you refer to this as a, as a reco ring to your customers or is that just not part of? Good question. So, well, that was actually a long conversation we had. Um, we, we originally were planning on doing it and then we were, we just kind of thought about, you know, not many people probably know what a record ring is anyway. So we may as well just call it something different. <laughs> so we're just more referring it to kind of a collaborative CSA, um, which, which has worked for us. Um, I think down the road, we may, we may end up using that terminology if we kind of create a more true record ring. That's something what we won't do this year, but, but maybe, maybe next year or, you know, hopefully in, in next year. Um, but, uh, it, we just figured it, it was not, it, it was not necessary just because most people, at least in the, in the kind of greater barrier, hadn't heard that term anyway. Great. 
great. And then uh, do you have any advice for people who are just starting out and setting up their own record ring? Yeah, um, a couple different things. Uh, I would say that um, it's really important to develop strong relationships with other food businesses, both the businesses that you have as buyers, but in other ones that you may not be as um, involved with. You know, for example, there's businesses that we've, we've sold a little bit of stuff to here and there just for a few things they make, um, but they've been really interested to work with us and I think having those relationships allows you kind of that built-in um, network. Uh, so I think that's an important facet of it. I think um, another thing that's important too is, is focusing on kind of creating a model that will, will be viable for years to come and not just be viable for the, the current COVID-19 situation. Um, and I think that's what, that's been a bit of a difficult aspect because so many businesses right now are in flux and don't know what's going on. And so I think you want to be careful about not having your own business um, and also any other business involved uh, have, you know, necessarily all of their business or such a huge amount of their business at this point in time, at least in the beginning, be based on this record ring, but have it be more of another way they can adapt this situation, but also have it be a benefit for them for years to come. And I think, um, this kind of flexible model has, has allowed that, I'd, I'd say. Um, besides that, I think uh, making sure that you guys, all, everybody kind of also has a really strong um, network uh, and, and very does a really, do a really good job with communicating with their network of, of um, eaters. So I, I think in terms of having a really robust, robust like one letter system for a CSA, sorry about the phone there. <laughs> um, and I think beyond that, uh, See if I can mute this. Sorry about that, you guys. <laughs> um, beyond that, I think also having a uh, uh, so a good news like newsletter system, social media system, and allowing um, and just kind of mutually allowing your other businesses to benefit off of your network and, and you benefit off of theirs. Thank you so much, Cole. I, I'm sure that um, people have questions for you and we'll catch those in the Q&A session. Um, and just to let you know, the uh, 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 viewers, that the Q&A session will not be recorded. Um, um, so take notes um, and uh, we'll, we'll start that shortly. Um, so thank you very much, all of you, um, Tracy and Vanessa and Cole, for sharing your experiences. and. Um, you know, like Tracy said, in six weeks from now, six months from now, we might have a very different conversation, but this was really important to help people, um, you know, see what you've experienced and, and uh, you know, uh, learn, learn from you and be inspired by you to, um, to start their own record range. Um, I want to remind everybody to get um, to continue this conversation. Um, go to Facebook, uh, search Reco Ring Resources, and join that closed Facebook group. Um, it'll be a space for us as admins to share um, resources and experiences and um, to help um, other people get started. Okay, um, so the, the next and um, uh, Sarah, um, we, next up we have Sarah Bernal from the Center for Land-Based Learning, um, who's going to host the Q&A session. Um, and uh, Michelle or Sarah Tiffany, do you guys have anything to add at the, um, right now to, um, as before we transition to um, the Q&A part of this webinar? Nothing for me. Um, we have quite a few questions, so that's great. Okay, all right. We're gonna go ahead and stop recording this, um, this session and- um, um, I might oops. chime in, Lin Linda. Actually, for this part of the Q&A, we are gonna record it, but I do encourage people to take notes. If people um, after five o'clock will be, at five o'clock will be stopping the recording. Um, and so if you wanna ask more personal questions that are specific to your, um, your situation, you can go ahead and stick around at that time. But these questions will go ahead and be on the video. Got it. Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Sarah Bernal. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for submitting your questions. I'm just going to go ahead and um, run through them. Um, the first question that we have is, um, are there any thoughts, this is for the entire panel, um, all the farmers and Linda as well, any thoughts on setting up a Facebook page associated with the group 
So you can use Facebook ads for promotions. So I guess, have any of you guys used Facebook ads to promote your Reco Ring? Um, I, we have not. Everything has been done organically just through promotions on our own farm pages. And um, there was an education piece prior uh, for me with on my page, just explaining what Reco was and pointing them to um, the video where the guy who started it explains it. Um, but no, we have not placed any ads at all. Okay, great. Cole or Tracy, anybody else have any information on ads, using ads on Facebook? No? We haven't done it yet. Okay, great. Okay. We, we, we haven't. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't either. Um, just, just wanted to note, though, that, that other folks um, who work with, some of their social media postings, though, have brought us quite a few CSA members. So it, it just definitely you know, kind of kind of goes to, to say that's, that's a big benefit. Awesome. So using social media postings as a form of advertising, not paying for an ad directly through Facebook. Awesome. Um, the second question we have is someone wrote, sounds like this is meant for a group of producers to attract a larger group of buyers. Could the pickup spot be one producer's farm stand? Uh, do you guys see any conflict of interest or a reason that uh, one of your farmers could not be the pickup location? I don't see why it couldn't be, but just for in our situation, most of us are out in the country, obviously. So it just um, the we named our group after our county. So um, we picked a spot in town where people are going to be doing a lot of shopping anyway, near a Costco and near all the other grocery stores. So we just tried. We were very intentional in trying to make it as easy as possible for people, especially during COVID. So if they're going to be out shopping anyway, getting their essentials, oh, the Reco Ring pickup is right there. So I don't see why it would be an issue, but um, just for the sake of what's going on, we just tried to keep it simple and have it in town. That makes sense. So it's about convenience for the customer to be able to access your, your products. Cole or Tracy, any uh, recommendations on pickup locations or on farm pickups versus parking lots? We're, we're also too rural to have a pickup, pickup location at our farm, but we're pretty far out here. But um, we do think that there's a couple of benefits additionally with having them um, at sort of specific locations, uh, you know, more, more in areas where people are, are purchasing. Um, in addition to just kind of doing our, our normal CSA drop-off sites, we also do CSAs at companies as well, um, and where we drop off product there. And with the COVID-19 situation, that's kind of gotten weird because a lot of people at these companies are not, are not there currently, but we, we're hoping that they kind of do uh, that just work out you know, in, the, in the coming months. Um, but the advantage, I think, of that long-term after COVID is uh, a lot of those companies are pretty large as far as the number of them. And a, a number of folks maybe aren't as committed to signing up for a CSA, for example, but purchasing something for a radical ring at that company is pretty low. Um, it's pretty low, like, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but pretty low investment on their part. And so um, for a company, we work at, we sell at one company, for example, that has like 3,000 people who work in that building. So it allows you to expand your, your um, just the number of people who are aware of what's going on very, really rapidly. And we do that site also at the, the cafeteria for that company as well. So a lot of people go and see it. And it's a nice way to kind of advertise for free. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of people all in one location. <laughs> yeah. um, and then Tracy, it sounded like you used the the brewery. Was there a lot of negotiating that had to go into finding a parking spot or or a place to meet? Or um, I just was I, I was like looking for breweries that had good parking lots, and honestly, I got lucky. The first brewery I reached out to, they said yes, so it did, made my job very hard. And then uh, one of my other customers, uh, who's in Littleton, another, he she knows a local brewer, and she he said that he was also interested. So. I think just a matter of networking and reaching out to like what you think is going to work. And obviously certain parking lots aren't going to be like user friendly. So just a matter of like, like scouting the area and just going for it. Excellent. That's great. Um, awesome. Thanks guys. The third question we have is a question for Vanessa. Um, and the question is how did you get 1,200 people to join in less than six weeks? 
it was super easy. Like I was saying before, just really, or really organic. I already have a strong social media presence. So I already had over a thousand people, a thousand on my Facebook page. And I was, as I said earlier, I was very intentional about picking the producers that I wanted to work with. And so I collaborated with another CSA farm that's been around for over 30 years. They already have a huge following. They're really well known in the area. Their Facebook page has over 5,000 members. So I was like, okay, I'm going with Wellspring and then bringing in, looking for other producers who could offer different things. So we do have some overlap, like other producers offer eggs. Um, but, and right now I'm only offering eggs until, cause I'm in Wisconsin, not in California. So our season's just starting. Um, but it doesn't really cause a problem because you already have your customer base. And that's what's nice about collaborating with other producers because you get more exposure and same for the other producers. It just really, really has taken off. That's great. Does anyone, uh, Tracy or Cole, would you guys have anything to chime in there or move on to the next question? Um, yeah, no, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Getting members. Um, so that's great, Vanessa. It sounds like you found really good partners that had strong followings and you yourself had a really good presence online. So um, great place to start. Um, question number four is also a question for Vanessa. And the question is about how many customers each week do you actually get out of the 1,200 members? Um, so the first week obviously was the slowest because it was new. Um, and I had 40 dozen eggs, so that was probably roughly 20 to 30 customers. This week I have 68 dozen, so it's usually about right now 30, 30 to 40 individual orders. So some people get one, some people get two dozen, some people get three, but um, one thing that I will share, because at first, the first couple weeks, I was obsessive about responding to people instantly. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. That like takes so much time because you're always, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is taking so much time. It was like being on the phone. It was, so now I just like wait till the end of the day and then go through and do it. But at first I was like, I have to respond right away. But if you do it that way, you're going to always be on the phone. It's going to take field time away from you and things, other things that you have to be doing on the farm. So just set designated times throughout the day or even at the end of the week to deal with all of the requests. That is great advice. <laughs> um, excellent answer. Okay, we only have five minutes left in the q and I'm gonna to get to question five, um, which is, can you talk more about the payments? I heard that you can't make payments on Facebook. So do you get around this because it's a private group? And that's for the whole panel. So I guess uh, if any of you are open to talking a little bit about payments and how you take payments, that would be great. We do everything by a square. Um, through our Square Store, our Square Store, uh, as far as, as all individual purchases, there is a there is a fee that's involved, and I have to look it up, but I think it's somewhere around three percent. Um, although it's it's a good chunk, we feel it's worth it ultimately, um, just because it, it ends up saving us a lot of a lot of headache having to try and track down payments. It's very simple that people pay right away, uh, so it, it's worked pretty well for us. It, I, I'd say you know setting up a lot of the online stores, Shopify Square. Um, they all have pretty, and there's some ones that are more specific to, to farm businesses as well uh, that I know are good too. Um, it, it's a pretty simple process that I, I think even even though it is a bit hefty as far as the fee, it, it'll ultimately save you some time down the road. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cole. Um, we, I accept several different payments. So I, when I am contacting my customers, I ask them how would they like to pay? Because I take Apple Pay, I take... Um, the Facebook pay as well as um, PayPal. So, and then I just direct them to, I also do Square. So I have just signed up in all the, the pay options because again, it's a convenience thing. I wanna make it as easy as possible for, for my customers. That's great. There's a lot of options out there. So that's, that's good to know. Um, the next question is for, uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. That would be uh, question number six, which is, uh, it's a question for Tracy. The question is, are you in Denver? I have relatives in North Glen that would be interested. What's your Facebook group? Um, yep. And are you open to other producers joining your ring? Yep, Rake Ring Denver. You just ask to be a producer and you list what you do and I'll make you a producer. It's not that hard. Rake Ring Denver, okay. Transparent. <laughs> Perfect, thanks Tracy. Um, the next question is, uh, if you're organic, would you recommend that the other RECO members be organic, particularly if you're certified organic? And that's just an open question to the panel. So for our group, that was a discussion that we had as the three main admins, and we just came to terms within ourselves, like what will we accept? Um, are we okay with people who are not necessarily certified, but who are transparent and have organic practices. And we as a team agreed that we would accept people who are not certified, but who practice organic standards. And some of the other things that we came to decision as a group is that we wanted people to only sell things that they're producing. So not to bring things in from other farms um, because one farm that we work with, they buy their eggs from another producer. So we wouldn't allow them to sell their eggs on our group page because they don't actually produce them. So yeah, those are just terms that you need to come, um, you just have to decide amongst your admins, really. Yeah. I would, I would echo that as well, um, just because I, I think you might limit yourself a bit in, in, in being able to, to bring in a number of different um, producers and businesses. Uh, for, for, for us personally, it's a little bit different because we're kind of an adapted recurring model. Um, it's more just based on our CSA. But we, we grow 50 different crops, and, and even though it sounds like a lot, it's really not much in the grand scope of everything that people buy as far as groceries in a given week. And so if we want to realistically have people um, also have the option to purchase kombucha, for example, um, teas, for example. A lot of those producers, um, you know, if it's a kombucha company, for example, that's maybe hard for them to get certified. If it's a value-added company that sells, for example, like pickles or salsa, there's, they can have organic ingredients, but it's very difficult for them to get certification um, for their production facility. Um, if, for example, folks that grow flowers, there's a lot of growers who do flowers who, who aren't certified organic, but are organic. And so I think for us, it's, it's more about the values of that company, a uh, particular business and, and, and the way that they operate. And we want to prioritize kind of having local independent businesses, um, even if they're not technically certified, they, they kind of live up to their values. And that's more important to us than, than just their certification. Uh, so we didn't want to limit, limit ourselves as far as we work with by doing that. That's great. That's a great answer. Thank you, guys. Okay, this is going to be our final question of the formal Q&A section, um, and then there'll be a few minutes after this where folks will stick around to ask a few more specific questions. Uh, the final question is, how do folks manage inventory if you don't know how many orders you're going to have each week? And that's for everyone. Um, so for me, it's very easy because I'm only selling one thing, but just from talking to the other farmers that I work with, um, you, you do have to go into it knowing what you have available to sell. Um, and then if you need to cut it off, just you, you can post on your, on your posting on the page, on the group page, that orders are done, we're cut off, we've sold everything. So it, again, it's just being aware of what you do have available to sell, especially if you have other um, streams of revenue like CSA or an on-farm store. So just that, that is something that you have to track. Yeah, in, you can edit the original post and then just put a big sold out in all caps so that people coming in later can see, oh, that, that item's gone. Yeah, I was gonna say communication is key. So just communicate with your customers. If you run out of product, just say, I'm out this week. If they place the order, don't take their payment. It's, it's pretty like, even if you aren't keeping track of inventory, you have to know at some point what you have for sale. So. Just, just communicate with your customers. That's the biggest thing they want to hear. They'd rather hear that they're that you're out of product because it means your product's good, and they'll they'll be patient with you. It's my kind of train of thought too. 
I, I would echo that as far as communicating. Um, in terms of using online Square Store, uh, one thing that, that is difficult about it is, is because we have about 50 different products on, on our store, um, if we are kind of getting orders over the course of the day and I'm in the field and all of a sudden we're like, oh shoot, I don't think we have enough eggplants for everybody, I can't drop everything I'm doing in doing that. So we do have to communicate for that type of situation. But um, despite that though, I think also timing of the recovery uh, kind, of, kind of is important as well because the way that our, our schedule is kind of created, we usually, um, based on when we send out our availability list to our, our wholesale buyers uh, versus when we send it out for our, um, our other uh, like CSA members and, and I guess kind of recurring members, so to speak, by having those kind of timed right, you can kind of get a certain orders before the other ones and that allows you to, to kind of have a pretty good idea um, because the vast majority of everything we do is going to wholesale. If we have those orders come after the recurring orders, we can pretty much make sure that we're always going to have enough as far as the, the recurring orders or CSA orders. That's great. Awesome. Thank you guys for your awesome answers. And thanks for all of you guys who submitted questions. That was really informative. Uh, we're going to transition this back to Linda to close us out. We only have a few minutes left. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We've really enjoyed this conversation with Vanessa, Tracy, and Cole. And um, again, go to Reco Ring Resources Facebook group um, where you can continue the conversation and get some get get resources. Um, and uh, Sarah and Michelle, at this point, do you do you have anything to to add as we close? Um, this is Sarah Tiffany. Just adding that um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up and stop the recording here. Um, there will there will be an email that it's sent out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, and we'll include a number of the resources that were discussed today um, and, um, and as well as a recording of this video if you want to share it with others that might be interested. Um, and for those of you who uh, we have a couple more questions that are a little more specific for those of you who want to stay on the webinar for a few minutes and ask questions you're you're more than welcome to do that.